Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Ivick and I'm the content manager here at eLearning Brothers. Today we will be talking about how to use Captivate to update your eLearning courses that include Flash files because Flash is dying. This session will be recorded and we'll email a copy of the recording out to all of you who've registered so you can keep an eye out for that. If you have questions during the webinar, we'll be ready to answer your questions in the questions panel and I'll also we'll take some out loud during the webinar. So go ahead and use that as you need it. We'll get to as many as we can. If we can't get to your question, we'll do our best to continue the conversation offline afterwards. And today we have James Kingsley, our senior technology architect with us today. We're really excited to hear what you have to share, James. And without further ado, I'll turn the time over to you. Awesome, thanks Jeff. Thanks. Well, hello everyone. As she said, I'm, I'm James Kingsley. Uh, I've been uh, working in e-learning for, I don't know, like 16 years, something like that. And uh, part of my, uh, the thing I always love is combining web technologies with uh, e-learning. And that's what I've strived to do for the whole time. And so part of me is very sad about the demise of Flash because I, I was a Flash developer back in the day. Uh, as a matter of fact, my Twitter handle is on enter frame, which if you were a Flash developer, that's, that's probably sounds familiar to you. Uh, but I'm more excited that now we have all these great opportunities because uh, when your course publishes, publishes the HTML5, that's the same technology that the rest of the web is work using. And so it makes it a, a lot easier for us to dive into it and really start doing fun, cool things with it. Um, and to, to learn more about it too. If you go on Stack Overflow and look for uh, e-learning questions, you might not find as many, but if you look for just HTML5 questions, you're gonna find a lot of people there that are providing responses. So sad for Flash just demise, but happy that we have this wonderful, robust opportunity uh, now in there. And so um, the best way you can find me, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Are we seeing my screen? No, I have to pick a screen. We are seeing, we were seeing Captivate. Oh, what are you seeing yes. now? We see Thanks. Captivate. Excellent, okay. So the best way to find me is probably just to go to uh, LinkedIn. I'm James Kingsley on LinkedIn and you can connect with me there. Um, whenever I do new blog posts or webinars, I try to post something on here as well. So if you're following me on LinkedIn, uh, that's the best way to, to get in touch with me or to see what kind of weirdness I've been up to lately uh, in there. And then I um, have to throw in a pitch. I'm, I'm also the uh, the owner of Review My eLearning. And that's a great way for you to send your course out to your subject matter experts, your uh, team members, your clients. And it puts a nice little form down the side and you can collect feedback. You can sign developers and assign uh, issues to those developers, et cetera. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool tool. Please take a moment, check it out. We have a free level, so um, it won't cost me nothing to, to give it a try. So let's jump right in. Um, be before I get started on uh, diving into this, uh, I asked Steph to prepare a couple of polls so I could get kind of a feel for why you're here and uh, what your level of Captivate experience is. So if we could drop in that first poll. Um, All right, so you can select one or two of these options. Either any of them that apply to you, go ahead and select them. And we'll give you just a minute or two to finish your votes. Tell us all about yourself. And, I, and I'm going to make a little prediction here that probably uh, we're going to be about half and half. I think some folks, if you've seen some of my stuff before, you might just be here to see uh, what They're kind of just James are. Kingsley fans, yeah. but we didn't put that as a poll option. So it looks like most of you have voted and we are a little higher feeling the pressure from the death of Flash, but it is pretty close between the two. Right, yeah. yeah. I will share those results for everybody to see so you can see it's pretty tight right there. Oh, wow, wow. Well, so hopefully this is going to help you out a lot with that to give you some ideas on how to uh, accomplish that um, that switch from from one to the other. Um, and so 
Uh, we'll save the other poll for a few minutes later, so because I'm I'm eager to get into this. I'm eager to get into this. So let's jump in. One one of the questions uh, as soon as uh, we started advertising that I was going to do this, uh, folks started sending some questions, um, including uh, what do you do about rollovers or mouseovers, that that kind of thing. Uh, so let me uh, jump in, make sure that you're still seeing my screen. You are awesome. And so this is an example uh, of one of the ways that, that we address this. And so in our original course, in, in the original course, each one of these, uh, by the way, I've, I've taken out a lot of the, the client content on here. So that's why you're seeing icons and stuff. Uh, in the original, they were mousing over each one of the images and they were inspecting the appliances and they, they would have to look at the tag on the appliance or maybe look at the, the rust on the appliance type thing. But in you know mobile, we, we can't do mouse over. We can't detect if your finger is hovering over the, the device. So we had to, to come up with a new way to do that rather than the mouse over. So this one was, was fairly straightforward to us. We replaced the instructions a little bit and we just gave them an option to click this little magnifying glass and that would pop up a larger view of the image and then they could close that. And so they could come in and inspect one. Let's see if I can get one right. And then they would drag this answer over there and then they could come back and inspect another, drag the answer there. And you might notice here that the feedback just popped up right there where the instructions used to be. And that's one of the things that, that we found very useful is to try to reuse areas of the screen for, for later on in the slide, because if we tried to fit the instructions and this feedback all in the same area here, then we really start to get cluttered, particularly when we get down to um, the mobile size. On there. Now, if, if, if you're not familiar, I'm using Chrome right now, but this works in pretty much every browser uh, out there. So if I hit my F12, that will pop out my uh, developer console on the side here. Uh, we found that handy when we're doing local testing because you can change the size of this development panel and the side effect of that is as I push the panel over, it'll change the size of my Captivate file and I can see what it's going to look like as it starts to shrink down there. That's a nice quick way to, to get a, an overall idea of what the slide's going to look, look like on mobile. It's not gonna be exactly the same, and I'll show you a couple of ways to, to get some, some other previews of your content in there in a minute. You might have noticed this little thing popped out. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. That's Captivate's way of saying, hey, you've got too much text in there. We're not gonna let the font get any smaller on mobile, but we do want the learner to be able to see it all. So we're gonna put this there, the learner can click it, and it pops up and they can read the rest of the text. Uh, it's really useful most of the time, but we had a couple of times when uh, we, we were struggling with it a little bit. And so we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So let me jump over and just show you kind of how we created that in Captivate. And so you can see the layout. I have my fluid boxes in here. Uh, and I have a fair amount of fluid boxes on this slide, as you can see quite a bit of them. Uh, if they're numbered correctly, I think we must have about 36 of them. Yeah. Oh, 37, 38. So there's a fair amount of fluid boxes on there, and that's to make sure everything's gonna be lined up right when, when it slides down. As I mentioned here we have, this is our instructions, but then we created different states for that text area. And so we have, different feedback for each drop when you get one correct. And we're controlling that with our drag and drop options here. So we have object actions for our drop zone here. And we're just telling it that when the correct thing lands on it to change the state of our feedback to whichever was the correct feedback for that. That's nice because it really freed up a little space for us on, on that slide there as well. 
Now, I have one that's a, a bit more complex, um, just from, uh, I guess, a thinking it through kind of way. And that's really the key to a lot of these, is just trying to rethink that interaction and how else can you accomplish the same thing within the confines of uh, whatever tool you're using, in this case it's Captivate, and mobile and still keeping it looking, looking nice on the screen. So on this one, I'll jump over to the actual published version of it. James, we do have a question about those text boxes. Yeah. How do you address accessibility when using the states for those text boxes? Well, that's a great question. I haven't tested that on here. Um, wasn't a requirement for this project, but I'm going to research that and I will get back to you on that. Hmm. So I think the answer is have a very flexible client. Yeah, yeah. Well, or yeah, if it's required, Surely Captivate has thought of that. And now I want to test it, but I don't have time to test it right now. Uh, we'll, we'll get so, to that afterwards. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. If anybody out there is familiar with that, please feel free to throw it, throw it in the chat. Uh, whether or not changing text on a state like that is uh, accessible. All right, now on this one, and clearly I've changed the content to uh, protect the, the client there. Uh, so on this one, the original was a mouse over, so you move your mouse around and you can find the areas that, that you need to click. And so you click on it and over here we're popping up some, some information about that particular thing. But that's really not going to work at all in mobile. And here's my second trick for the uh, developer console. Um, I mentioned before that you can grab it and resize things like this to kind of see how it's going to look. You can also, in Chrome at least, uh, there's a little toggle here where you can tell it to emulate a cell phone device or a mobile device. In this case, I have a Pixel 2 here, but there's a, a bunch to choose from, and there's actually, there's even more. You can hit the edit button, and they have a whole bunch more that you can add if you want to. It does two things for you. One, it resizes your content to the size that it would be on, in this case, a Pixel 2 XL. But the other thing it does is it changes the way it requests the page because Captivate is listening to see if it's on a mobile device or on a desktop device. And it will uh, change its behavior based on, on that. And so it's more than just resizing it. We sort of have to trick it and make it think that we're running it on a phone. And so if I refresh this, so now we requested the page with that mobile header. And when we come in, you see these are already highlighted for me, and we've changed the text here. It used to say, you know, move your mouse around. Now it just says tap each hotspot. And so they're right there, and the learner can, can just tap on them. And we're accomplishing that with an advanced action pop that open, probably advanced actions. Here. Uh, thankfully, the good folks over at Adobe built in a, a Captivate variable. This is a variable for the for Captivate called CP Info Mobile OS. And they do all the testing with their own JavaScript to figure out if it's what operating system it's running on. Um, if it's running on a desktop, then it will assign this uh, variable to zero. Um, if it's running on, I don't remember what the other ones are, like Android is one and Apple is two and uh, Windows Mobile is three, if anybody's using Windows Mobile. Uh, but, but in our case, we don't really care which particular operating system it is. We just want to know, is it mobile or is it not mobile? So we're doing a quick check to see if it's equal to zero or not. If it's not equal to zero, then that means we're on a mobile device. And so then we just trigger these things. So it's a conditional um, advanced action, and it just changes the states of those hot areas that I have, and it changes the state of the instruction text. So I'll jump back over there, and I'll just show you those uh, states on there. 
So because I'm using a shape and I told it to use it as a button, it does automatically create a rollover state for me and I wish that I could target that, but it doesn't seem like you can an advanced action uh, change state to rollover. So we just made a duplicate of it and called it mobile and we were good to go there. So that's that one's a little trickier um, and it doesn't provide the exact same experience for mobile and desktop, but sometimes that's the best way to do it is just to consider your device and, and target for that as well. You could even, if you wanted to, branch slides completely based off of that, that variable if you wanted to. So you could take them to a whole nother slide if they were on mobile. We do have a quick question about that. Do you know if Captivate is differentiating between tablets and phones or would a tablet just display the mobile one? Yeah, a, tablet, a tablet's going to display as mobile in there. Uh, there's some other ways that you could probably get the, the width and stuff. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on. Um, another method that we, we used when reimagining, if you will, uh, interactions is there were some in, in the original set of courses that had a lot of what we call click to reveal. So maybe like uh, tabbed interactions or um, uh, you know a lot of folders and you click on them and new information pops up. Uh, sometimes they had uh, like accordion type things, you know. And so you, I don't doubt that somebody could build that same thing on a slide and captivate. But what we found worked a lot better for us is actually just to split that interaction out over as many slides as it took uh, to accomplish the same effect as, as, the, uh, as the original course. So for a tabbed interaction, um, if there were four tabs, we might actually have five slides. So the first slide is the introduction explaining it, and then when they click on a tab, we just seamlessly jump them to another slide without them really realizing that, that they went to that other slide. I have kind of an example of that here. Um, and so this one was, there's an introduction video and then uh, a little bit of talking and some instructions. And then we get here where uh, we finish up uh, the instructions and we wanted the, all the buttons on there so that the learner knows what's coming. When we're talking about clicking the buttons, they can see that there's some buttons there. Now, in this case, they're not actually buttons there. They're just shapes. We haven't triggered them to be buttons yet. Each one of these slides in this section, these first three, are just automatically moving to the next slide um, pretty seamlessly so that the learner doesn't realize that, that they've moved from one slide to the next. As far as they're concerned, they've still been on the same slide the whole time. Then when we get here, where they can select a button to, to learn more about each one of these options on here. Then we start jumping them back and forth to one of these slides. So depending on which button they pressed, we jump them to the, the corresponding slide that has the information for that button. And from there, uh, we make it look like that button's disabled. Again, it's not really even a button there, it's just a, a box. These two are buttons, and uh, we jump them back to the other one. And we program this next button so that throughout the whole set of slides here, what do I have, seven? Throughout all those seven slides, that next button actually jumps to whatever the next slide would be. So it would be slide eight in this case. So if the learner, it was a free navigation course, so the learner can, can go in and view the content in any order that they like. And so if they wanted to skip this part, they could easily just hit the next, or maybe they were going back through the course again, they are already familiar with that. They could hit the next and it would just jump past all seven of these slides, giving them the feeling that this one interaction was one slide. Uh, we found this technique to be really valuable because even though you could stack and build up, you know, uh, more and more things on top of each other and create a lot of uh, advanced actions to control whether the button is dim or not dim, and, uh, switch out the image and stuff. In the end, it was really just easier and it helps your mind get wrapped around it better just to split it up over, over multiple slides. All right, so there's that. I have to scroll my 
to-do list here for you. Uh, so let's go back. We had to break it up. Let's talk about the, the drag and drops that we did here. So we had a couple of uh, different types of drag and drops. I, I already showed that one. Um, I wanted to talk specifically some about this one because we're, we're going to talk a little bit about static fluid boxes there. And that's uh, that's a really cool feature in uh, Adobe Captivate that we found pretty invaluable. Um, and you, you need to learn when to use it and when not to use it, but when, when you get it down, it really helps a lot. So let me pull up this uh, live demo of this one here. So obviously our course wasn't on horses, but uh, you, know, you can just imagine something else over there. And so we wanted them to be able to drag and drop uh, all these labels to the item. So we can pull it up, drop it on there. If they get it wrong, no. then it just slides back over there to the other end. Uh, and you can see we're using the same technique here where we're just updating the text uh, using that possibly not ADA compliant uh, <laughs> state there. Uh, and so then, so you're probably familiar with drag and drops and you're, you're wondering why I'm showing you that. But here's, here's the, the really cool thing about what we ended up having to do there. And that is using Captivate's uh, static fluid box. And what that does really is it, it lets you position multiple items inside of a fluid box and even stack them on top of each other or lay them out wherever you want and it will keep them there that way. So I wanna jump over and just kind of show you an example of what I'm talking about here. So here I have just kind of a layout of, some, of a course, you know, some text and stuff. And, and maybe I have three images and while the narration's going, I wanna animate those three images, you know, in and out so that when, when they're talking about the square, the square will be on the screen, and then when we're talking about the circle, the circle will be on the screen, and then this will be on the screen. So right away you notice that they didn't drop right in there, and that's because I forgot to turn off my unlock from Fluid Box, which is also an excellent thing that we'll talk about in a minute. So I'm going to turn that off so that I can lock it in there. So now you'll see when I drag it over there, uh, it highlights the Fluid Box, and I can drop it in there. Great. Um, there's a good chance I might need that image to take up the whole thing. If I'm trying to show, you know, somebody the the position of, you know, where to find the switch on the console, they might need some detail. They might need that image to be big like that. So now we're done talking about that button. We're going to talk about a knob. So I want to show this picture of a knob. Oh, but wait. Captivate just put one on top of the other instead of layering them on top of each other. I, I really wanted this one to be right on top of that, but it, it won't let me do that there. And then if you add more, it's just gonna keep on uh, filling up the box there, but not letting you uh, layer them on top of each other. So uh, what I need to do is I'm gonna drag these back out and you'll see this is one of the things that, that you learn <laughs> after doing this a bunch. Uh, now that they're in there, there's really no way for me to get them out of a fluid box. Uh, every time I try to move it somewhere, it's trying to stick it in a fluid box until I check the unlock from fluid box. So I'm going to unlock them both from the fluid box. I can drag them back out just so I can kind of show you what was happening or what our solution is. So with that fluid box selected now, there's an option down at the bottom when you scroll down to make it static. And so the box itself will still move around because it's a part, you know, it's a child of this other fluid box. So it's going to rearrange itself around the screen as needed for the device. But now I can line my things up in here any way I want them to be. Except I didn't check the box. Uncheck the box. This is useful sometimes too, uh, because things will, will stay where they are if they're not locked in a fluid box, but you can kind of see what happens. Now they're just floating around everywhere on the screen. There are times you might want that to happen, uh, not in this case, so I need to go back and uncheck my box, drag it, drop it back into the fluid box. Select this one, 
uncheck my unlock, try to drop it back in there. So now those items will stay there even when it wraps down here to the bottom. They'll stay in whatever position that we have them inside there. And that's nice because when our timeline is moving along, they'll fade in and out as necessary with the, the text on the screen or the voiceover on the screen. So let me jump back over and show how that was necessary for these drag and drops. So there's my drop zone. And so in order to keep that always right there on that line, we had to make this fluid box stack. And the same thing down here, in order to keep these in this nice little staggered line here, we had to make the fluid box that's holding them static so that it wouldn't try to stack them all up on top of each other. Uh, in this case, because these are kind of small uh, boxes, we probably could have fit them all in there, but then you never never really know how they're gonna be arranged and they're gonna show up different. In, in the actual course, they were, they were uh, bigger boxes than, than they were here. So static fluid boxes, your friend, um, use them when you need them for, for things like that. Because in this All case, right. like I said, go ahead. We do have a question specifically about fluid boxes. If you are still using Captivate 9 and you don't have fluid boxes, is there still a way to do this? Yeah, actually. So in Captivate 9, it uses those uh, breaking points on there. And so you would just need to... In some ways, I'm a little torn. I, I still debate whether the, the breakpoints are better or the fluid boxes are better. I like the breakpoints because you can design the slide to look exactly what you want it to look like at that breakpoint. Um, but the fluid boxes are nicer because they're much more uh, utilitarian across multiple devices and sizes. But yeah, you should just be able to, to line it up on top of the, uh, the right area. And in, in because the when the breakpoint when you're using breakpoints it just scales everything down until it hits the breakpoint and then it switches to whatever view you have for for that breakpoint so you can position them there. All right, thank you. Sure. All right, so um, something else I wanted to mention about this concept of breaking slides up into multiple uh, slides in there. Um, we were also doing that with some other other areas too. We had like some glossaries and things, things, things that the learner may not ever really visit. And so, just one thing that you want to keep in mind is, if you're tracking, I don't think I don't know that many people track it this way, but I just want to make sure. If you're tracking course completion based on the number of slides viewed. You're probably not going to put it at 100% in any course because there's always, you know, like somebody skips out past one slide or something. But even if you had it at 90%, you know, if, if my course was only uh, 20 slides long and seven of them was that one interaction there, then there's a, there's a possibility the learner could just hit next and skip seven slides, um, and that's going to throw off your thing there. So if you if you're dividing a lot of content out. Uh, you want to come back and consider how you're grading completion in there because uh, slide views either might not work or you're going to have to really lower that, that number down to accommodate those extra slides that you have in the course. Um, speaking of breaking it up, uh, I'm going to move kind of into some uh, templates, do's and don't things that, that we discovered uh, going through. Uh, a lot of times in in the older courses, because you had a very static area you were working in, uh, people felt just fine with filling the whole thing with images and text on there. Uh, but now, when we're trying to think about, well, that might still work on a desktop, but it's really not gonna look very well on mobile, we, we discovered we need a lot more white space and just padding around things to, to give it some flexibility so that uh, it, it'll show up. And so that meant for us that uh, sometimes we had some really dense slides with a lot of content on them. No interactions or anything, just, just a lot of content, but we would still make the decision to go ahead and split that into two or maybe three slides just so that uh, it, there would be more room on the screen for, for the mobile users to, 
to have uh, their view squinched down. Um, and if you do that, keep in mind also, you know, adjust your slides completion view there as well. So we were talking about, I'm gonna see if I can pull that thing back up again. Uh, this one might do it for me too. Uh, just trying to get this thing down to cause one of those pop-out things to happen. There we go. So we were talking about these. Now I, I have this ridiculously small right now. That's that's much more smaller than a mobile would be, but I just wanted to il illustrate what I was talking about coming back to this. So we discovered that sometimes those would pop up uh, for not necessarily a great reason. In our mind, there was still plenty of room for the text or maybe just like one word was cut off and then that thing was popping up. And so there's a couple of ways, if you're seeing that, particularly someplace where it doesn't make sense, like a lot, we have them sometimes on the title of the course. And as you can see, there's plenty of room on the title of the course there uh, for that thing to, to go. And so through some troubleshooting, uh, a few of the things that we found are when they were popping up on our title, we quite often had just an extra space at the end of the title, or maybe a few extra spaces where somebody like copied and pasted the title in and it included just a little extra space there. Uh, even though that doesn't really take up that much more room, uh, I guess Captivate's logic on it uh, assumes that maybe there's gonna be some more content there or something, and they were popping up that thing. So if we saw it someplace where it just really didn't make any sense, we would just first thing go check and make sure there were no spaces there, and that, that cleared up a lot of them for us. Then another one was um, these two options down here. So on your slide itself, under style, there's a minimum font size and there's an option to enable uniform scale. And uh, I've been messing around with this one a little bit today, but generally we actually kept our minimum font size at 13. So let me talk about what that means. So this text here is 16 right now. And as it scales down for mobile, Captivate will make a decision uh, of when to change that font from 16 to 15 to 14 to 13. And this box here says, hey, stop when you get to 13. You know, if you get to 12, it's just ridiculous. It's gonna be way too small. People aren't gonna be able to, to read it. Um, but what we discovered is occasionally, we might want to just play with that number just a little bit because if we just had like the word it was causing that pop out thing, then we would just try and maybe knocking that down to, to, to 12 to see if we could squeeze that one more word on, on there. Uh, and then the enable uniform text scaling, uh, that tells Captivate that if I have multiple text boxes on the screen, let's say these, that when it's scaling that font down to scale all the text boxes at the same ratio down. Um, because like the title, you might not want it to scale down. There's plenty of room up there for it. You can leave that big, right? So you might uncheck it if everything is working well, but sometimes if it's unchecked, then what starts happening and we saw this particularly like in uh, like multiple choice questions that had a lot of text in them, is like one of the question responses, the font would scale down really small, but the other one only had a few words in it, so its font stayed big. And then just to the eye for the design, it just it looked haphazard because you know one sentence had tiny font, the next sentence had big font, and then small font. So on those, we would enable that uniform text scaling. Uh, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis and I don't know that there's a solid guideline on there. I guess if you have multiple text boxes with different amounts of text in them, then you probably want to enable the uniform scaling on there. But you just end up having to play with it a little bit to, to get it to work. Um, another tool that we found really useful is I was showing you how here, you know, we, we can do this. Um, but hey, we're developers, you know, we, we know our way around technology, right? And then, um, as you know, when you preview a course from Captivate, it puts that little bar, that slider bar, lets you slide it around on there. I showed you we can pull up that mobile. 
but for our end clients and our and our subject matter experts, we didn't want to have to explain to them how to how to pop open the developer console and all all that stuff. So one one of the cool features of of Review My E Learning is the the courses over here and the comment panels over there. But this bar is actually adjustable in the middle. So when our client was reviewing, or even our internal team and subject matter experts, they could just drag that thing over and then make note in here of anything that didn't look right there. Again, it's not a true mobile experience, but it's giving us a, a much better idea of, of problems that we could anticipate on mobile uh, by dragging this bar back and forth. And review my e-learning there. And then um, I wanted to reiterate, I may have mentioned it. But I just wanted to talk for a moment about the importance of planning your slide out in advance. Um, there are some times that we would even just grab a pencil and paper or a whiteboard or something and think about how we're gonna uh, build a slide. Uh, because when it comes to fluid boxes, uh, it can be hard to uh, make changes later without going through a lot of clicks on there. And so I'll, I'll give you an example. So we, we've kind of got this one built out and we have these, these bits of text. But let's say that we decide, we, well, you know what? It'd be really great if we just do a, an image, you know, in between here, but we want that image to be optional. It's just for desktop, you know? So uh, I'm just gonna select that fluid box and I'll come up here and I'll add a, a new fluid box, but it's, it's grayed out. I cannot add a new fluid box. Um, you, you can't add or delete fluid boxes uh, if they've already got something in them. in them. And as you saw, it can take you a couple of clicks to get everything out. So I'll come and I'll take that. I'm gonna unlock it from the fluid box. And then I'll grab the other one. And I'm going to unlock that from the fluid box. I'm going to drag them both out. Oops. Hopefully. Drag them both out. And now you can see suddenly my thing is, is available here. So now if I wanted to, I can go ahead and I can say, well, let's put that into three there so that we'll have a place for our image in the middle. And then I'm going to have to remember to uncheck that box, drag it in there. And check that box, drag it in there. So it's a good idea to have a pretty solid feel for what you want your slide to look like before, before you build it. Uh, we were using an excellent mobile template uh, that, that gave us a, a leg up on it, uh, and it accounted for several different layout styles. Um, but even just, like there's no way really now to change the layout style of this uh, without, without a lot of hassle on it. So it's better to spend a few minutes, plan out any, any, anything more than just your regular like text image, text image, you know, uh, plan it out a bit uh, so that you know uh, what you're, what you're going to be doing when you get in there. Um, and then another one is this one, we'll see that uh, is unlocked from a fluid box. Um, but when I go to move it around, you notice it, it's not, moving I cannot move it anywhere um, and sometimes I'm going to show you why this is but you're likely to forget it and it'll drive you crazy and you'll spend five minutes doing this and wondering why it's not working um, and then just remember if I go over in my position here this particular box is set to under the advanced position settings set to always align to the center of the slide and always align vertically. So if I uncheck both those, now I can move that thing anywhere I want. If I check it back again, it'll pop it right in the middle. I can still move it up and down because I don't have the other box checked, but it's always gonna stay in the middle there. And then I can check that and it'll jump down in the middle. This is pretty handy sometimes if you wanna pop up some feedback or, or you have a, uh, extra information that you need to pop up because it works pretty well in pretty much all views. You see, it, it starts to get down really small there. Uh, we were using it for some extra information uh, that the learners were using. 
And so they could click a, a link in the text, and we had the, the link set up to display a pop-up, very similar to this. Ours was a little more complicated. Uh, had it set to display a pop-up there. The other thing we were doing is we would actually use a, an image on the background of that, that shape, uh, and the image would have a little close button there. We really just set the whole thing to be a button, and that way, if they clicked anywhere on it, it would hide that and take them back to their content, uh, but you don't really know that looking at it. And so people like to have that little uh, you know, red X up there so that they know how to close, close a window. And so uh, just by adding that, people were, you know, they aim for that red X, but really they could just click it and you know, get rid of that. All right, where am I now? Any questions? We did have one that just came in uh, specifically about that box. They were wondering why the text isn't flowing around the box or the shape, the green box. Well, it's it's actually, it's not contained in a fluid box. And so it's uh, outside of all the, all the text that's in there. If I uncheck that, and then I drop it in this fluid box with that text, we'll see that it, it's going to start wrapping around it there. All right. We do have some general questions about HTML5 and Flash. Um, we can save those to the end, or if you want to take a break and address them now, it's up to you in your flow. Uh, yeah, let me see. Where are we? 42. Let me, let me try to get through a couple more of these things real quick, and then we'll come back. All right. Sounds good. So now I'm going to just jump real quick into some really weird stuff that, that we found. Uh, so let me show this one here. All right. So in this, we have this great little text box here. We want to capture the learner input. Captivate's nice enough. They, they already highlighted it for us. So we can type in there. We hit our submit button. All is good. We moved on. But Two things happen. If I go back to that slide, uh, I can't. If I click out of that slide, I can no longer click in it, out of that text box. I think I can no longer click on it. Something very strange has happened there. So on this slide, it might not matter that much because the uh, the cursor was already placed inside there. But if you had any kind of interactivity or anything leading up to it, or a learner was just curious or accidentally clicked anywhere on there, now they are completely locked out of that text box. And this took us quite a while to, to figure out what the heck was going on there, because it's not the default behavior. It works fine, you know, like every other time you use the text box. But for this series of courses on every one of our slides, we were seeing this problem. So I'm gonna pop over my developer tools. This is where, you know, Putting my developer hat on, one of the things I do in here a lot and when I'm troubleshooting stuff is I right click on it and I say I want to inspect it. And so Chrome will show me all the elements that are currently on the screen. And if you mouse over some of these things, you can see it highlights them so I can see where they are on the screen. So the first thing I notice is what is that huge box that's sitting on there? I don't see a huge box, why is it there? And then I saw that the ID of that box is line one. And that's when it all started to click in for me because lo and behold, this thin little line is called line one. Now that is just a standard shape. All we did was we did insert line and we drew it across there. And it's just decorative, you know, what should have tipped us off a lot earlier is you notice the line is missing completely here. That line is gone. Uh, but we were more focused on why can't we click in here uh, on there. So, of course, the first thing we did is delete the line. Boom. Text box started working just fine. Uh, we kind of liked the line. So we went back and we changed it and we just used a tiny rectangle. It's actually a rectangle smart shape that we just made. Itsy and it works just fine. For some reason, it didn't like the line. And, and it's not like we made the line somewhere else. It's just a Adobe Captivate line. Uh, so look out for lines, I guess. <laughs> and lions. Uh, 
And then we were also experiencing some issues where it wasn't keeping our test. Now this one, let's see. Let me go into the one that doesn't have my fix. So here you can see I can type in some text. I'll hit submit. And then when I come back, my text is gone. It's not remembering. And I, and I am storing it to a captivate variable because we're in fact using that to, to send as an XAPI statement out of there. And so um, I dug through, did some troubleshooting, and found that there's actually a, a little bug in the JavaScript. Uh, in Captivate's JavaScript there. So I rewrote that function, and now in, in ours, uh, it'll it'll remember that text when, when you bounce back and forth in there. And then lastly, I'm just going to hit on the XAPI real quick. Uh, for these, oh, actually, there's something else here, too. Uh, it, we want this to be multiple lines of text. and if you ever get confused, it's the show scroll bar option that makes it multiple lines of text. I guess the thinking is eventually, if they type enough, there might need to be a scroll bar. Uh, but but we were looking for something that said multi lines of text or something. Uh, but it's not. It's called show scroll bar. When you do that, then then you can start adding multiple lines of text there. And so then uh, I'll just show real quick what my action is on this. So we're doing some custom XAPI stuff. The learner uh, answers like throughout all the courses, maybe like 500 of these questions that they're going to answer. And it's all, how did you feel about this? And what are your thoughts about the future? It's very free mind, you know, type type what you're thinking type thing. Uh, and so we we actually we're saving them in our LRS. And rather than use a gazillion advanced actions, we created a shared action. And so then our course developers, they just drop that shared action in. Uh, they fill out these for each one of the boxes, which is basically what the XAPI statement needs, which is a title, a description, and then the response. So they can fill all that out in there. And then uh, we've got some JavaScript package inside there to send the statement. And then when they're on the website, and we're still building the site out here, but when they're on the website, they can go to their profile and they can see all the replies. They can see all the replies that they've made so far throughout the course. So we pull them in, we group them by each module, we show them what the question title was, what the actual question was, and then what the response was. And they can either print that, or they want them to have a way to uh, like download it. Uh, email it to their career counselor, maybe, or show it to their, you know, their grandma type thing. And so that this enables them to print it as well. And so for that, we're using a little PHP on the back end, uh, just minor, just a little bit of PHP on the back end, uh, mainly just because we're trying to avoid having them log into anything twice. And then uh, the rest of it's JavaScript to connect to the LRS and pull that data in. Yeah. All right. Before everybody jumps off, because I know we're almost there, uh, I'm going to put all the examples up on course portfolio, so you'll be able to come here and play with those examples as well, and we'll send that link out too. All right, question time. All right, let's get into it. Um, before we start with the questions, I will say we've had several other people comment and say they have problems with the line item as well. Hmm. So I guess the best strategy is just make that skinny rectangle. Just, yeah. And the line item is not there. <laughs> so let's see. We have had a lot of people asking, is there a way to test your course to find out which files are using Flash? Is there a way to um, make sure you've fixed everything and there aren't any hidden Flash elements in there? Um, I know eLearning Brothers has a solution for this, and you were one of the original creators of it. So would you like to speak to that sure. a little bit? Sure. Yeah, so we have our, our Flash Finder. Uh, I like the old name for it. It was Flash File Finder, which I like to call F3 because the search for key on your thing is F3. Uh, so we have our Flash Finder, and it's it's really built to look through uh, LMSs. So it can connect to your LMS uh, through different methods, APIs, FTPs, et cetera. 
and, and it can connect and it can scan through all your courses and look for any courses that contain flash files in there and provides a nice report for you. Uh, we're working on a solution that will also just scan your, your desktop computer for you or a network drive as well. Uh, so you can scan those locally and see if anything has flash in them. And it's pretty cool because it returns back the name of the course and the ID and how many flash files it found and things like that. In a lot of cases, it can even tell you who the developer was of the course and what tool it was made in, that type of thing. Uh, if, if you're just thinking about your, your, your one individual course that you're working on today and you want to see if it works in flash or not, uh, just launch it in Chrome because uh, Chrome's not going to play flash for you anymore. Um, it will pop up a little thing that says, hey, this plugin isn't supported in there. And it'll it'll let you know that, that it's not, not going to work. All right, good to know. Then we have a couple questions about Captivate specifically. Can version 9 complete all the HTML5 conversions? Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, a, a lot of you, I, we, I don't think we use these things very much anymore, but the, people used to use a lot of Captivate widgets. And so they'd have like a calendar widget or a notepad widget and stuff. Some of those were based on Flash. Uh, but so you might have to find replacements or rethink how to do those because they're not core Captivate components. There is actually uh, an HTML5 tracker in Captivate that you can run and it will tell you if it finds something that's not supported in HTML5. Cool. And then do you generally find that Captivate is more suitable for recreating Flash activities versus Articulate, Storyline, or another authoring tool? Oh. You gotta pick favorites. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. So you're gonna get in hot water here. So uh I really love the way Captivate's responsiveness works so that it can flow the material and fit in any device. Storyline is not actually responsive, you know. They do have their Rise tool. It's not as powerful, um, but you can build some stuff in Storyline and then import it into to Rise. Um, Captivate is extremely powerful, um, but for us, sometimes for really complex interactions, I will turn to Storyline. And as a matter of fact, in this conversion process, and again, it was like 100 hours of training between these two projects, uh, we actually ended up building like maybe three interactions in Storyline, and we imported them as web objects inside of Captivate, uh, just because it was partly a matter of time too. We had a really tight deadline, and we would have just spent a long time, or we would have really had to compromise that interaction uh, in there. So I guess if you need a really complex interaction, Storyline might be better, but it's kind of six and one, half dozen of the other. All right, so then I think a little related to that, we've got an attendee who downloaded a bunch of the eLearning Brothers games, so thank you for supporting eLearning Brothers, but they saved a ton of them as Flash and embedded them into Articulate as web. Is there a way to get that content out to create it in Storyline 360? Hmm. Yeah, so what you could do is you could go just launch I mean, you're going to have to rebuild it, really. I mean, unless and I'm not, I'm not as familiar with our library. Uh, if they still have a subscription, maybe we have a new HTML5 version. Of, we of do that. have a bunch of the games. I know we updated for Storyline in HTML5. You would have to put all your questions back in, but that might be the easiest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Keep that subscription active. Yeah, I. I've seen some some kind of cool ways, like in this, in one of our projects here, the other one, uh, there was a resource like catalog that they could use, and it had it was pulling the data from an external source. So rather than rebuild all that and captivate, we built a small HTML5 page that pulled the same. It did basically what Flash was doing, and then we we added that. So I'm wondering when you said they might have to re-enter their questions, if those questions still exist, the data somewhere else in there. But yeah, you should you should probably be able to rebuild it either in Captivate or 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 Storyline. Uh, but there's no easy push a button and it gets done. Sadly, yeah. no magic button. Yeah. All right, so we have uh, one question. Button, not, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Someone has heard that HTML5 requires more bandwidth than Flash. Have you found that to be your experience as you're recreating all these? No, I would say it's the opposite. For 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 me, uh, that's that's been my experience because Flash uh, compiled to a binary, like a like one solid file, and that file had to be downloaded and completed before you could run anything. And it had a lot of overhead with it because the you had to have a special plugin to to decompile that binary and display it. But with HTML5, it's a lot of it's right in the page. Uh, and then the rest of it can be brought in piece by piece as needed, if it's needed. Um, so uh, you get smaller chunks and, and uh, less overall data, less overhead too. All right, we are running out of time, so we're going to take a couple more questions and then we will wrap up. So we had a comment. Um, when you were showing, I think this last course example, there was a bug with the text not being remembered, the text mm -hmm. that they had submitted. Um, what was the fix? What JavaScript should we fix to make that text be remembered? Yeah, I was, I was going to show it, but I, I knew that I was going to run out of time today. Uh, so basically, and, and we can try to include a link to it or something, but there's, uh, there's a, a built-in Captivate function that when uh, a text box is displayed, it checks to see uh, what the old value of that text box was. And there's just a little bit of a mistake in, in Captivate stuff, but I'm sure they're gonna fix it right away on it. So, uh, but yeah, we, we can try to include a link to, to that JavaScript. It's a bit hard to explain right now. <laughs> In the next two minutes. <laughs> in, the, in the two minutes we have left. Okay, so the last question we'll take. Uh, in screen recordings, the mouse scroll or a drop down click were also flash. Is there any way to take care of that? Ah, yeah, that wasn't a part of either one of these projects that, that we were doing. Uh, it sounds like they're trying to pull that old project in and just republish it. Uh, out of Captivate, and if so, I would hope that Captivate would just take care of that all on its own and replace that for you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with it. I have to, I have to look at it. E e email us, and we'll, we'll take a look at it and give you some. All right, we will. we'll follow up on that one. So uh, that's we are about at time. I'm going to take the screen back from you. No, no, no. I know, I know. You're going to miss it so much, right? <laughs> and this is our last slide. Um, oh, well, this is our last slide. And if you have any more questions about the Flash Finder tool that James mentioned or recreating your courses, our custom solutions team is at the ready. They are happy to consult with you see if Flash Finder will help you, see if they can help you recreate any of your courses. So just shoot us an email or call us. We'd love to hear from you either way. And we are so happy that you all joined us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, James, for taking the time to share all of this knowledge with us. And this was recorded, so don't worry. We'll be emailing that out. And we hope to see you all on another webinar.